I say in my book, it's the worst meal of the day, the typical breakfast. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of fasting during the walking hour absolutely devastated the fitness community, bodybuilders and athletes who believe that they constantly need to show in energy. Yet, um, I came with this concept, being aware of the concept of hormesis already early on, right after the military uh, service, I started to realize how critical it is to understand that stress is inherent to our life and it's very important to, uh, to acknowledge that and design our day and our lifestyle and especially our diet to get the best out of stress rather than fall victim to it. Mm -hmm. I realized very early on that when I expose my body to nutritional stress, that means lack of food. That's the meaning of nutritional stress in this case, lack of food, lack of energy, energy deficit. My body responds with amazing compensation. Hey everyone, this is Ari Witten and welcome back to the Energy Blueprint podcast. I have a very, very special guest today, uh, someone that I've been looking forward to interviewing for a very long time. Believe it or not, I've been following his work for nearly 20 years at this point. I literally read his first book, The Warrior Diet, uh, when I was in high school, when I was a 16-year-old kid. Uh, and it was one of the, you know, among some of the first health books that I had read at that time, and it was very influential on me. So. He's been doing it for a very, very long time. He is a, the author of The Warrior Diet, as I said, as well as a new book that he just published called The Seven Principles of Stress, which I highly, highly recommend everyone pick up on Amazon. And it is none other than Ori Hoffmeckler. So welcome, Ori. It's truly an honor to have you on the show. I've been, I've been a fan of your work for a very long time. Thank you, Ori. It's a pleasure seeing you face to face. And having a conversation with you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as, as we were talking about before I hit record, I was telling you that this book was very, very cool to see you publish this very recently because, as I, as I mentioned, I've been working on somewhat of a similar book. And it's, it, we've both seemed to have arrived at the conclusion that the concept of hormesis, which we're going to explain it more in, in this interview, uh, the concept of hormesis is really the crux of good health and resistance to disease and energy levels and uh, longevity as a whole. So I was super excited to see this, and uh, the book is is awesome. So thank um, you. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm so I'm just giddy with excitement that we're getting to geek out on hormesis in this conversation, which is my favorite subject. So uh, you know, let's talk. Uh, oh, one other thing I should mention, by the way. Um, Ori Hoffmeckler is one of the actual pioneers of the intermittent fasting movement. I mean, he was literally one of the first people to ever even talk about this idea and really was instrumental in popularizing the whole idea of eating one meal a day and kind of going the first part of the day without eating and then feasting at night, which then became a craze. I mean, it was, it was really your work that was instrumental in making that happen. I believe I was the first one to put intermittent fasting in practice. Mm -hmm. In fact, the word intermittent fasting came two years after the warrior diet. Oh, wow. Well, uh, what were you calling it at that time in the warrior diet? Did you have a name for it? We called it the one main meal per day. Okay. Uh, there was no word like intermittent fasting, but I call it the warrior diet feeding cycle. Mm -hmm. Two years after the book, in the beginning, I was accused of dietary blame for committing dietary blasphemy. <laughs> How dare I tell to people uh, to skip breakfast and lunch? Uh, breakfast was considered the most important meal of the day. And I say in my book, it's the worst meal of the day, the typical breakfast. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of fasting during the walking hour absolutely devastated the fitness community, bodybuilders and athletes who believe that they constantly need to show in energy. Yet, um, I came with this concept, uh, being aware of the concept of hormesis already early on, right after the military uh, service, I started to realize how critical it is to understand 
that stress is inherent to our life and it's very important to, uh, to acknowledge that and design our day and our lifestyle and especially our diet to get the best out of stress rather than fall victim to it. Mm -hmm. I realized very early on that when I expose my body to nutritional stress, that means lack of food. That's the meaning of nutritional stress in this case, lack of food, lack of energy, energy deficit. My body responds with amazing compensation, uh, compensating ac actions that help me better endure hun hunger, better endure stress perform better and in fact I noticed how my body was transforming itself already early on to become leaner and meaner on the good way. Mm -hmm. um, the impact of uh, intermittent fasting on the cognitive function is amazing. Later on, two years later after the way that was published, they did the first studies on intermittent, fa what was called intermittent by Professor Mark Matson, who found that and he quoted my book, by the way, as the first references. <laughs> he contacted me and asked me for testimonial on his article in Lancet Journal. Mm -hmm. uh, they found that when it put mice and rats on a diet similar to the way that there was extension of 50% in lifespan. Rejection oh, percentage? 50% extension of wow. lifespan. That's massive. And uh, when they ejected mice, toxin that cause brain dementia or disease that, that mimic Parkinson, Alzheimer, the, the mice on intermittent fasting rejected this toxin. Wow. It was incredible. This is the first time that the warrior diet got recognized as something that is real. Uh, the BBC gave us incredible break at that time. Uh, but I'm telling you, Ari, when I came with this concept, it was very strange to people. Nobody believed yeah. that you should deliberately put yourself under stress. Yet, in my latest book, which is a continuation, in a way, of the concept of the warrior diet, I clearly prove, I try to prove and bring the evidence that not only stress is inherent to us, healthy mammals, healthy organisms are programmed with the instinct or desire to put themselves under stress. Mm -hmm. Ari, as, a, as an educated person who already understand it, that probably will be even more intense for you. If I now take away your ability to exercise alone, mm -hmm. how would you feel in several days? Yeah, it, it would. You're absolutely right that I would immediately, and I've done this because there are certain times when I can't exercise for whatever reason. And I start to get irritable. I start to get depressed. I start to get just annoyed. And yeah, you're absolutely right that there, and it was a big aha moment for me in reading this section of your book where you talk about this because I had never really thought about this kind of innate programming that we're all designed to seek out stress, which is- We are designed to seek idea. stress, absolutely. I mean, we have here rescue dogs and cats that we took, take to our house and all of them with no exception, you can see it on animals, especially predators. They are looking for stress. Mm -hmm. if you don't give it to them, they will figure out a way to do it. Yeah. They are kittens or puppy dogs. They hustle and they bite each other. And children are raised. It's just that this concept is being crushed out of us. Mm -hmm. But it's not just physical stress. It's nutritional stress. And it's not just fasting. I believe that we have a tendency, healthy humans and animals, to crave for food rich in nutrients that mimic stress. Mm -hmm. I have been involved in this research project. It's called SAF, Stress Activated Food. Well, plants especially, I explained in my book why plants are more hormesis oriented than any other organism. On you, the you know, Ori, or let, me, let me interrupt you really quick because I feel like there's probably going to be a segment of, uh, you know, so some of these people watching this are maybe have already... Uh, heard me talk about hormesis and are yeah. already familiar with the concept. Uh, but some people might not be. 
And uh, there, there might be a lot of people listening or watching to this that uh, are, are kind of in the typical paradigm and thinking around stress. You know, stress is bad. Stress is a very negative thing. We need to avoid stress at all costs. So this discussion that we're having seems probably very odd and very counterintuitive for a lot of people who are not familiar with the concept of hormesis. So can, can you back up and let's go a little bit big picture for a minute and just explain, you know, what this is all about and why stress is actually not what most people think and why it's actually an important part of our lives. If I could say to the layman in the shortest way what hormesis is, it's the, process, it's the process of adaptability to stress. Each organism on this planet, from bacteria to human, is programmed with, 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 programmed with the capacity to take advantage of hormesis. Means in all organisms, exposure to low level stress, especially nutritional stress, will promote adaptability and resistance to high level stress of the same level of the same stress. So exposure to low level stress, promote adaptability to intense stress, and there are certain kind of uh, principles of all messes, which I mentioned in the book. This means that Exposure to high levels, instant exposure to high level stress, for instance, if you're not prepared, can kill you. Mm. Um, classical example of all messes is vaccination, learning, airy. You learn something, you start with one step at a time, exercise, fitness, you go to the gym, you don't leave immediately uh, 300 pound weight, you start with small, you feel the pain, you let your body adapt, gradually you're resistant to weight load increase, you're becoming stronger and stronger. This is the way we learn everything. Everything has an romantic principle in that. The question is not how inherent it is to us. The question, what the hell are we gonna do with this? What, how do we take this feature of hormesis or this knowledge and take the best advantage of it? How far can we go with this? Mm -hmm. In my book, I try to prove that we go much farther, far and beyond what conventional thinking uh, is. I believe that we can extend our life and maybe more than that. I believe that we not only can extend our life, our, we can improve the quality of life. I strongly believe that a guy like you, and there are many people out there, not the ideal specimen today, but definitely in a good shape and smart, maybe even more than those who are smart and can take advantage. I believe literally can get laid when they're 80 and 90 years old. <laughs> Why do I say that? Biologists already know that natural selection keep you around when you still can reproduce. I do believe that it is possible but not, that's not the only reason natural selection keep organism alive. Natural selection keep organism alive when they contribute to the species, mm. when they contribute to the quality, the survivability of their own species. And obviously reproduction and good genes is one thing, but there are other ways to contribute. Contribute to knowledge, being a guide, it's definitely a big advantage. We have no idea today how far we can go. And yes, Ari, if you, you, I mean, you and everybody or those who wish to do that, can possible extend life, double lifespan, and maybe more so, as written in the Bible, everything in our concepts of survival, culture, and priorities would change. You no more need to think about retirement when you're 65 years old, unless you choose to. Your dream, romantic dream, and creativity could go on way to the future. Imagine that your brain will never age and there is no reason for your brain to ever age. One day we are all going to die, but we don't have to die old, like typical old, and we definitely don't have to die with an old brain.
Mm-hmm. There is a lot of evidence that our brain, if we just keep the structure good, we'll talk about it, good healthy mitochondria and good healthy system that become resilient to stress, will never die with an old brain. So imagine how the equation between experience and improving your IQ as time go by, what kind of discovery and innovation we can create and how we can improve our lifestyle. So yes, we as human can excel far and beyond what we dream and it has nothing to do with the color of our skin or with gender or with anything that people try to stigmatize in um, um, it's time to focus ourselves from a different direction. Break the old dogmas, understand the true life and the true potential of life that we live in and move forward from there. Beautiful. So basically, you know, most people are running around with this idea of, of stress as bad and something to avoid. And in fact, what you are teaching is that stress, the right kinds of stress in the right dose done systematically, you know, systematically integrating them into your life uh, is actually the crux of health and longevity and resistance to disease and resilience to stress. Eric, I definitely, I'm glad you talk about it because those who think that stress is bad, they are right. Stress can be horrible. Stress can kill you. And there are certain kind of stress or chemicals that are so poisonous that can shatter your life very fast. What I'm trying to show that the same deadly stress that we all run away, if you just know how to take advantage of it, it could heal you. It will heal you instead of killing you. Mm-hmm. We are programmed in our body because we were created in a world which is stressful. Yes, the primordial world and the world today were, was and have been stressful now more than ever with a chemical around. Mm-hmm. So r- rather than running, just running blend away and avoiding everything, we should train our, or condition our body to resist stress. And I'm literally talking about, for instance, Lack of food, starvation can kill you. We know that human and animal can die from starvation, yet it is lack of food that have shown to extend life when regulated smartly of all organisms. Again, from bacteria to human, and in many times more than double the lifespan. Nutritional stress is a key. Mm-hmm. However, Ari, it becomes more controversial when we come into toxins because one of the stress principles is that low dose of toxin can create resistance to high level of the same toxin. And when it creates resistance, it actually does multiply other benefits, including anti-aging benefit, makes just your body stronger and more resilient to multiply other stressors. Mm-hmm. If I put you in an exercise, certain kind of exercise, exercise just not make it building your muscle. It makes you resilient to also disease, mm-hmm. resilient to aging. And the same with fasting. So exposure, everybody, is, there is a phobia of heavy metals. There is a phobia of MSG and for good reason. However, if people would just understand the truth, small amount of heavy metal are very beneficial for you. In fact, you cannot even survive without them. And so is small amount of radiation. And so is small amount of MSG. MSG is a horrible toxin, horrible. It's cause of it's obesogenic, especially the chemical MSG. But in small amount, it appears in one of the healthiest food that you eat from kimchi to yogurt and everything. Yeah. We evolved to be resilient to all this toxin. In fact, it's part of us. Mm-hmm. So we need to know the truth. Ari, you're right. We need to find the map understand them, how to navigate in the world that we are. And that's what the seven principle of stress book is all about. Yeah. So navigation and taking advantage of existing stressor, not only to be okay, not only to strive and extend life to the point that go far and beyond what we believe. 
Beautiful. So uh, I know you talk a lot about excess energy and, um, you know, a quick little anecdote, but at, at the time that I read your book when I was, I guess, 16 years old in, in high school, um, I was very into fitness, into the like bodybuilding. I was also an athlete. So I was doing kind of typical sports nutrition type of, of things. And at that time, you know, probably a lot of people listening to this will remember, um, everybody was preaching this idea that, that you need to, especially if you're lifting weights, um, to eat every two hours and kind of always be putting food into your body. Otherwise, you'll go into uh, catabolism and your muscles will start to waste away and your, your metabolism will slow down. And so you'll, you won't be in kind of fat burning mode and, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, at that time, your book came out it really did seem like heresy. It did seem very extreme, like, oh, there's this, this is crazy. And, um, and I remember when I tried it for the first time, um, the first day of doing it was absolutely miserable because <laughs> I mean, my body was entrained into a pattern of eating every two hours. So if I didn't go uh, every, if I didn't have a meal every two hours, I would get irritable and hangry and, and, and I, I felt intuitively, subjectively, I felt my body needs food every two hours. So uh, to do that for the first time was really difficult. And then after I did it the second time and the third time, something kind of miraculous happened, which is I discovered that it became no big deal at all to, to do that. And it became uh, just easy to go all day without eating and then having one meal at night. And it it was no longer a thing of that required any difficulty yet whatsoever. You, you are raising one of the most important issues today because now we are talking about people who are smart and they want to be fit and they want to look good and they are dedicated and they, these people are usually have more discipline than the average. All athletes and bodybuilders generally have more discipline and they are driven to succeed. So we are talking about a niche of people of our society that are actually in many ways superior to others, uh, those who are driven to excel. Um, but it is very sad and tragic and ironic that it is those people who totally miss the boat. And um, I was approached recently by a professional football player who wanted to talk. And uh, in my book, I... Uh, put some serious references, research reference and science about the fact that professional athletes, especially competitive endurance athletes, their lifespan is no longer than those of couch potatoes. How crazy it is that the fitness among us, so consider fitness among us, fitness among us, cannot live longer than the unfittest among us. Mm -hmm. Why is it that a specimen, a marathon runner, or cross-country skier, that very few in the world can even match his score, cannot live longer than a couch potato? Usually they, some, some of them die in their 50s or 60s. What is going on here? Mm -hmm. And Research at that time, it was done mostly in Europe, came to the conclusion that those athletes simply extend the level of stress that they were supposed to be under and violated by that means principle of homesis. And because they are so dedicated to score rather than survive, they had a tr they trade off their lifespan with their achievement. Mm -hmm. And um, I even raised the question, what's the purpose then of spot, uh, or spot conditioning if it shortened the life of an athlete? People should be aware of that. And many professional athletes start to be aware of that. Uh, I did my own research about professional boxers and fighters and um, other athletes, uh, sprinters, and realize that blood pressure, not only they don't survive well, uh, they become overweight and suffer from the same problems that people who never exercise suffer. Uh, overweight, obesity, uh, blood sugar disorder, 
this is just wrong. People who dedicated their life and invested so much work in improving their physical condition, maybe mental condition, uh, ability to resist pain, um, why do they pay so dearly with a shorter lifespan? Bodybuilders is one of, you just mentioned it. I'm saying like this, I admire people who just want to do it and they want to excel physically and they look. But guys, ask yourself this question. Is, are your priorities correct? If you don't mind to shorten your life, then we have nothing to discuss because I strongly believe that every animal and creature priority organism should be to live as long as possible in a good quality of life. It's the number one priority. If you have a family, your family need you around. If you have animals that you raise or rescue, they also need you around. And your community need you around because you're a good person. A person, male or female, you need to take care of yourself and live as long as you can and be healthy as much as you can. If you're ready to leave that for scoring for maybe a year or two, get the chance to score in sport, something is wrong with your priorities. I strongly believe that the typical bodybuilders would not survive natural selection. If the typical bodybuilder was living uh, 10,000 years ago, he wouldn't have survived. This oversized muscle with inferior muscle fiber, which are totally glycolytic, that means they don't utilize well fat fuel, uh, is a biological liability. Um, every, you, you are aware, you're educated, Ari, you read research, you know that the switch from car to fat fuel is a ubiquitous feature of quality and improvement in mammals. So muscle might my, increase mitochondrial density in the muscle is the number one feature. It is more important than increasing the size of the muscle. A guy who could be lean like Bruce Lee, for instance, probably with high mitochondria, have more explosive power than a 300 pound bodybuilder. It is not the size of the muscle. It's the quality of the muscle that you want to build and to reach the quality of the muscle. In fact, you need to do the opposite of what that you do. It is the depletion of energy. We talk about energy, which is the main trigger of homesis. It's trigger your body to improve everywhere. One of the key elements is the activator of transcription factors that signal your body to improve mitochondria, increase mitochondria density in your muscle. The muscle is the largest energy producing organ in your body. Your brain too. Pound for pound, your brain is even more. However, increasing mitochondria is a key and keeping your mitochondria has healthy is also a key. Mm -hmm. So energy utilization and energy efficiency is absolutely critical for your survival. You cannot do it by shoving six or seven meals a day because every time that you eat, you inhibit this mechanism from happening. You really need to be on an energy deficit to do, and the science is already there. There's evidence, they go far beyond the muscle, there's wake up or regeneration of dormant stem cells in your brain. Scientists now believe that your brain can actually regenerate itself if you do it methodically. Now, Ari, we don't even have enough mileage. When I came with intermittent fasting in the year 2000, that's when the movement just started, okay? What we are talking now about, you and me, don't even have enough mileage to know how far we can go with this. All I say is this. Guys, girls, when you look at fitness, just remember there is something which is called biological fitness. It's not the conventional fitness that you see in your gym. It's not what you read in a typical internet. It's not what you see in muscle magazines or fitness magazine. It's a fitness that is survival oriented. That's the number one priority. It has to do with your survival. It has to be your ability to live long in a healthy body. It's not about your performance to score. It's about your performance to better survive. 
So it has a total different criteria and way to do it. So why you guys go every day to the gym and putting so much work on the physical exercise, start to think how important it is to also exercise yourself nutritionally. Mm -hmm. Challenge yourself nutritionally the way you challenge yourself physically and you cannot go wrong if you just combine the stress principle number three is the combination number two so is the combination of nutritional stress and physical stress every possible research so that when you combine them both together you will get the idea result how far can we go well that's the exciting thing about life you are you have your home balance i've the principle is the same but each of us can find his own niche and we can experiment with ourselves. I show the guidance in my book, but how exciting it is to build your own personal regimen of excelling, you know? It really is critical. Mm -hmm. So as for your question, yes, conventional people do ex does exist. There were gladiators all over, the, all over the history. There were people that were ready to die on the sword and i respect that but i do still believe that people can be in extremely great shape by following different hometic principles okay by and the goal of you ari and other people me too i hope so i'm already all getting old but the goal of you ari to be in a peak shape when you're 60 years old, maybe 70, maybe even 80. It sounds crazy, but it's not impossible. And it's not just for male, it's for females too. Yes, you were told that you're aging faster and this and that. We don't even know how fast and how far we can delay sexual aging and overaging because our society never gave it a full try. Mm -hmm. The science, we can talk until tomorrow. You and me, we can talk until tomorrow, but the science is already there because aging is not what people think. Yeah, and, and one of the things you talk about in the book is that aging is more stress-related than age-related. And what, what do you mean by that? There's no doubt when you look deeply at the mechanism that drive aging, that aging biologically is more stress-related condition than age-related condition. It happened, aging eventually happened, because mileage do what mileage does. So people over the time become more and more vulnerable to stress. But nevertheless, aging is a stress-related condition. I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know how old you are. You look to me young, but 34. Okay. 34. I can tell you that there are many people, maybe millions who are 10 years younger than you are and maybe less already more aged than you are. Mm -hmm. They could have already an aged pancreas system. Uh, they can have the insulin system already aged beyond almost beyond repair, everything can be still. They have cardiovascular issue. A, or young, a children obesity can cause premature aging far beyond what we think. Diabetes, usually it's coming with a package metabolic syndrome. So aging can happen to very young people or the body become resilient to aging when you're already 60 in your 60s and 70s. Um, it is a fact. So understanding that on the, on, on the biological level or even on the cellular level, when we understand how the body operates and when, it, how, when the right genes and pathway are triggered, the body can start cleanse itself out of the old, weak and cancer cells and regenerate new cells 
when you can see how this picture, how this whole phenomena is happening, you would realize based on science that aging is actually a disease which is stress related, much more stress related than age related. And if this is the truth, and I believe I did put some evidence that this is true, we can resist aging way, way more than conventional thinking, let us believe so. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing I want to point out is when, when you say aging is stress related, a lot of people will still interpret that in kind of the traditional thinking around stress that, you know, oh, stress is bad. Stress is aging me. What you're, you're saying. Very right. You're very right. Thank you, Ari. Very right. Aging is a stress related condition, meaning aging is the loss of ability to resist stress. Yeah. The minute that you basically as a person inhibit your stress response system that means it's a system that is inherited to you biologically programmed to resist stress when it comes and make you resilient stress when you inhibit the system and there are things that can inhibit the system our industry is built to inhibit the system so you become vulnerable to stress hence you let the aging process take over your body simply because you took away, you shut down the system inside you that could resist it. The other way, have you give it a chance? If you follow with the right knowledge and the protocol and keep it trigger, aging cannot affect your body. Definitely not the way we were told to. Mm -hmm. This is the truth. So aging simply is the loss of ability to resist stress yeah and and i should also add to that that um if we look at the existing science right now on longevity uh and one of my favorite aging scientists is a guy named vince giuliano i don't know if you're familiar with him but um if if he has a, a couple free presentations on youtube on the science of longevity and if you watch those what you'll realize is that as far as the evidence right now on the most effective ways to actually extend longevity and prevent disease, it's all about hormesis. Everything is about hormesis. No question about this. Listen, you just said, you know, everything is about hormesis. Either we take advantage of it or we fall victim because we fail to do that. It's that simple. Yeah. But you know, Eric, the, the devil is on the details. It's honestly coming down to, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? Where the hell are we? I mean, theory is one thing. I, I saw so many people who talk about egg. I'll give you an example. Sugar is central to the problem. Sugar, not because maybe it's the worst chemical. We need sugar. Uh, we, we produce sugar, okay? However, excessive sugar is central to our problem because sugar is a fast-releasing energy food or substance that inhibit all messes. It simply inhibit a mechanism. It causes excess energy for every minute of excess energy in your body, hormesis is inhibited. Mm -hmm. Your ability to resist stress, the system is inhibited. Um, now think about it. You look at the grocery list and uh, on the top, you immediately find things with sugar or similar to sugar, white starch. Who doesn't have sugar and flour at home? Who doesn't have baking goods and cookies and pastry and this? Open the food channel. It's all about this. So we live in a society and an industry that encourage us to consume energy and fast releasing energy. In fact, unfortunately, our brain is build in a way that we get can get easily addicted to combination of sugar or sugar effect it really activates the same opioid receptors as crack cocaine simply because years ago during primordial time when the early diet was the early the main human diet there was not enough sugar or no starch at all so all these addictive uh, to sugar uh, at that time was not effective because you see simply were not exposed to that enough 
we were attracted to energy because at that time was a lack of energy. So the world changed. Uh, food scarcity was abundant at that time. Yeah. There was an evolutionary advantage for us to become resistant to hunger and lack of food. Nature compensate us for that. But it also came with an error that we are very attracted. We have very dumb food searching mechanism in the body that really get a lot of pleasure when we eat uh, food that provide us fast energy such as simple carbs mm -hmm. and sugar. We need to be aware of that because yeah. the number one principle of homesis is depletion of energy. Mm -hmm. Depletion by exercise, depletion by fasting is the number one principle. Energy deficit trigger homesis. It is so powerful that it can even overwhelm other factors. Ari, let's say that you are in the state of risk of exposing to toxin. You are under mental stress, you are exposed to toxin, and somebody push you a cookie to your mouth, okay? <laughs> Worst case scenario. <laughs> if you are energy depleted state, your body ability to resist all the above is at peak. You will survive even toxicity when you are under energy depletion. But when you are overfed and overloaded, even small amount of these uh, stressors or aggressor will devastate you, devastate you. People, you need to understand when you fast, you become extremely resilient, including to stuff that you want to scream, I can't take this anymore. I can't take this anymore. Reading my book, I really show you, and I show you the proof. Guys, so when you are, guys and girls, of course, so when during the day, which is the time that you walk and expose yourself to all these stressors, that's the time to under eat or fast. The time to compensate is in the end of the day. Nature compensates you beautifully. Also think, when you reach your main meal at night, supper, which was always the main meal of human, you come so depleted that you can tolerate the meal. You can utilize the nutrient. You'll never get fat and you'll never get overfed. All this nourishment is now a compensation for replenishment, a good one. Your body evolved to cycle. Nothing should come straight. Straight fasting and too prolonged fasting means starvation or chronic stress. Chronic stress is prolongation even of a good stress can become chronic stress. I really, really agreed and I wrote again on my book on the danger of overtraining, mm -hmm. on the danger of prolonged fasting. I don't believe in people. I know there are people who fast every other day or they fast three days and some of them fast two weeks and then they overfeed themselves for another three weeks and then they fast another week. What, what in your opinion is, is an optimal fasting length of time? In my opinion, it's supposed to be the one main meal a day principle. So everybody is different. And you yourself could be different in different situation. Have one main meal a day. The fasting does not have to be exactly completely fasting. I believe that sometimes it's better in to consume nutrient that mimic fasting. Mm -hmm. And there is amazing evidence, as you are aware, that there are certain kind of nutrient in wild food or wild berries, for instance, that not only don't elevate blood sugar, some of these long polyphenol or tannin actually reduce postprandial after meal blood sugar, which is a major factor. So why not nourishing yourself with this good antioxidant that actually lower your blood sugar, okay? Green tea, for instance, very complementary to fasting and so is coffee. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't have to be blind. There's nothing wrong with water fast, of course. But people have different tolerance. The last thing that you want, if you follow our message, is make people jump into 18-hour fasting when they're not prepared. Yeah. Rather build it gradually and build yourself in a way that fits your specific condition. If you're an athlete and you already deplete your body with energy, and I highly recommend to do it, yes, exercise on empty, you want to make sure that you support your body, especially if you have a split routine. Do have. Uh, I told you before, I'm working on developing you know, a product that will 
probably a revolution please completely the sport nutrition industry it really meant to support people the right way the biological way uh, um, to continue function and even be engaged in extreme spot activity while doing while putting the the body under hormetic challenge you know uh, following intermittent fasting so yes my answer is this don't overextend your fasting my opinion one main meal per day the rest of the day put your body under energy deficit as much as you can but if you need to support it with a few berries here and there some fast and simulating protein it's still fine mm -hmm. it's not gonna take you away Ari uh, the whole idea of nutrient that mimic fasting on exercise is very very important because the early human chain was predominantly rich in this nutrient. It is only now that we shifted away from a food chain that promoted homeostasis, that actually protect us from elevated blood sugar and blood lipid uh, to a system that now shoot our blood sugar to the roof, over spike insulin and increase blood lipid. Now, post prania elevation of blood sugar is many researchers believe the number one factor responsible for the current epidemic of obesity and diabetes and metabolic syndrome in our society think about it Ari. people have like frequent meals they start with breakfast blood sugar go up insulin spike become more resistant. then power lunch snack in between in between constantly then there is an afternoon snack and then there is a dinner and then there is dessert so every time they do it it should blood post blood sugar and leap it up totally shut the insulin system um no wonder why the vast majority of us are overweight and most people over the age of 55 either overweight or obese already uh, the rate of metabolic syndrome are ever growing and so now is the rate of cancer um, I I strongly believe that cancer is not a necessary disease I think we are predominantly designed for anti-cancer than to get cancer we are predominantly designed for anti-aging rather than aging but we were told to believe that it's normal to get cancer and it's normal to get age. Look, doc, this doctor diagnosed cancer, they don't even have a second beat. They already have the protocol. Okay, we'll do chemotherapy, we'll give you this chemical, we'll give you this chemical. Hey guys, how about giving your body the chance to never get cancer? And if you do have it, I strongly believe that your body can still beat it. Are you familiar with the system? you know what the heat shock protein system when it's activated can do mm -hmm. you know how much energy your body can generate with the immune system if it's intact to devour cancer yeah and actually th this is a great segue I would, let's let's go into what what exactly are the main mechanisms on a on a cellular level that make hormesis so important for resistance to disease and extending longevity um, what's actually going on in our cells that, that's the, making that happen? The key sensitivity is to a level of energy. Your body sensitivity to energy is impeccable. So we have a very smart mechanism in the cell that the, when it sends energy depletion, that means the ATP molecules are lo losing one phosphate and then two phosphate. Uh, so ATP convert to AMP, right? ATP is three for fat, losing one to ADP, losing the second phosphate is AMP. AMP, the molecule, is not just an empty energy molecule, it's actually a signaling molecule. It activates a very important longevity pathway. Many research believe the most important longevity, there are the longevity pathway. It's called AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase. And AMPK is doing multiply, it's an enzyme basically, that does multiply action in your body, but one of the most important ones beside anti-inflammatory 
and uh, work in synergy to um, activate uh, um, uh, anti-inflammatory hormone to circulate in your system and improve. The most important action of M AMPK is the inhibition of mTOR, which is the mechanism, uh, the growth mechanism that builds your muscle, but it also drives the aging process and it also causes inflammation and it also builds cancer. Yeah, let, let me interject something here because people might not be familiar with these terms. So uh, AMPK, as you mentioned, um, adenosine monophosphate activated kinase. And then uh, on the other side, we can think of it as kind of the opposing molecule. We have something called mTOR, which stands for mammalian target of rapamycin, which is um, an anabolic sort of tissue building thing. And, and in fact, uh, within the bodybuilding and fitness industry, people often talk about mTOR as, uh, it's usually talked about as a good thing. We want to activate mTOR because it's involved in muscle uh, building and so stimulate mTOR as much as possible multiple times a day. Um, and that whole discussion of, of mTOR and kind of wanting to activate it is actually very disconnected from uh, the longevity and aging science uh, where aging scientists are overwhelmingly saying mTOR is a major driver of aging, we need to keep mTOR levels low. It, you are very right. It is one of the interesting, out of many, paradoxical phenomena in biology, where in biology, in your body, all factors and all factors, nothing is completely bad and nothing is just, uh, I mean, there is a, we need to see things there. Are. The paradox about mTOR is that mTOR is essential for your life. Without mTOR, you won't be, even be able to grow. Mm -hmm. So especially for young organisms, mTOR play an essential role in helping them grow and, and become robust and resilient to the hardship or whatever stress they're gonna get. Without mTOR, we can never get mature and young organisms with deficiency of insufficient mTOR, they don't even survive. Yeah. So mTOR is critical to life. However, once you reach maturity and i'm trying to be over simplistic here for understanding once you reach maturity the overexpression of mtor in your body can be little detrimental because now you live in a body that is no, no longer growing so overactivation of mtor in a non-growing body lead to the following number one on the cellular level it's a recipe right it's a recipe for enlargement itself the enlargement of the cell immediately age the cell and then the reason why the cell is aged so mTOR is a cellular growth mechanism um, the reason why the cell is aged is to prevent their cell from becoming cancerous mTOR can easily cause a turn cell into a cancerous cell it can cause tumors uh, aging of the cells is the first defense of the body to prevent the cell from, multiply, uh, from multiplying and becoming part of a tumor. But that's not a great solution because cellular aging creates an inflammatory lesion in the tissue, which causes inflammation in the surrounding cell. And Ari, you know, inflammation put time factor and with cancer. Always inflammation over time becoming cancer everywhere, everywhere. You keep an inflammatory marker too long and they signal your body. The worst part of it is nuclear factor kappa beta. This is a, a cellular, a, 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 this is a gross transcription factor that is immensely or inherently associated with cancer. When you see uh, tissue or cell with OVEX, expressing nuclear factor kappa beta, you know that this area is prone to get cancer. Guess what? When you activate your stress response system correctly, when you take the proper nutrients, and I listed them in my book, they are all inhibitors of nuclear factor kappa beta. We live in an industry that constantly promote this factor to express itself. From sugar to pesticides and many other chemicals and the way that we, we basically make ourselves vulnerable 
to all these inflammatory markers, right? Um, yeah. and, and I should also add, it's not just like athletes and bodybuilders who are doing that, but, but also um, the, just the average kind of typical Westerner is also somebody who tends to be grazing all day and has an energy imbalance in favor of, of chronic calorie excess. Correct. So you bodybuilder, yeah, you're right in your theory. mTOR is very anabolic, and so is the anabolic steroid that you take. That doesn't mean it's a good thing to do. You can still build quality muscle, I repeat, quality muscle, without overactivating mTOR. And we talked about it before, Ari. We talk about the fact that energy exercise while fasting trigger factor like PGC1 alpha that signal your body to increase mitochondria density in the muscle. So you can be a very lean person. You don't need to weigh much, still carry fiber quality that not only can generate exercise durability much more than the typical bodybuilder muscle, it's serving for the rest of your life and hopefully a very long quality life, but giving your body the ability to stay energetic and functional it is muscle fiber with high mitochondrial density and the capacity of the fast mice survivor to utilize fat fuel that always protect you against obesity and diabetes for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. If your muscle fiber, it doesn't matter how muscular you are, is predominantly glycolytic, that means it just utilizes glucose and carb for energy rather than fat, you are prone to obesity and diabetes. People need to wake up and understand it, so that your fitness needs to be smart, not just the size of your muscle. Don't check it. And in many ways, women are better than men because they don't have this compulsive vanity, some of them, to build big muscle. Mm -hmm. So their fitness uh, approach is much smarter. And I also think, Ari, because we talk about it, that at a once you get matured at a certain age, you've got to be smart enough to change your diet and exercise. You can't continue in a straight line. Always take your survival and yourself as a person as a top priority. Respect yourself. Yeah, so, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I've actually gotten to that age recently where my mentality has shifted around this, where I used to be very fitness uh, oriented and and uh, you know, about fat loss and muscle building. And that was my world for a very long time. And um, now I'm at an age where my interests, especially I have a young son, uh, you know, is slightly over a year old now. Um, and my think it, it changes your thinking. You know, now I think more about, I, I need to be more conscious of incorporating lots of fasting into my routine and avoiding uh, calorie excess and avoiding the, the you know, overstimulating mTOR and accelerating aging, I want to be around for a very long time uh, to see my, my son grow up and hopefully have another kid and, uh, and, and see them grow up and also be functional enough when I'm in my 70s, 80s, 90s and beyond uh, to be able to still get on the floor and crawl around and play with grandkids and go, go snowboarding and, and things like that. So you know the, the mentality... Uh, you, I completely agree. It should shift to more of a longevity. What you, yeah, what you just said is clearly your, your instinct as the human animal. You, the, what, what talk now was the true human animal within you. You feel respect enough to yourself to understand that you are needed for other humans. Your yeah. son, for instance, your followers, people around you, your family, I mean, and yourself. So if you like yourself and you need yourself, you really want to desire a seat to a top priority that, yes, in your 60s and 80s, 40 or 50 years from now, you are going to be looking as good as now and in many ways even better. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said before, experience combination with healthy brain. I truly believe we've increased the IQ to a level that we cannot even imagine today. Yeah. Truly. So, so, so let me ask you on a, on a practical level, um, what other types of hormesis you, we've mentioned fasting, we've mentioned 
exercise. What other types of hormesis should people be aware of and, and incorporate into their life? Well, what I mentioned before, first of all, nutrition part, don't run away. I gave a list in my book. Don't run away constantly from toxin. Don't be so obsessed with this. Learn the area and understand that uh, heavy metal are not always your enemy. If they're naturally occurring, they're naturally occurring some of the greatest food. So if you like seeds and nuts, and just because you're reading some article on some quacky website, they stay away from heavy metal and any food that have heavy metal, whether it's seed or nuts or cocoa like chocolate, uh, stay away from that. I, I believe, do your own research. And if you're not sure, I have the research in my book. Mm -hmm. um, really live your life simple. Don't be afraid of nature. Nature is not your enemy. It's stupid chemical theory. Be afraid of chemicals. And um, other way of all messes, positively, I believe it's good to expose yourself to heat. I believe it's very healthy to also expose yourself to cold, freezing cold, to a certain degree. Uh, it clearly shows that all these challenges trigger the same mechanism. Oh, it all come down to the heat shock protein response, which is amazing what it does to your body. It's over 300 enzymatic compound or compound that when you are in a peak homeostasis state, peak energy depletion, like glycogen depletion, your body now have this system, this compound percolating your system, searching and destroying every weak and sick cell, including cancer cell, your body becomes very efficient in tagging these weak and cancer cells and destroying them. Your immune system is activated actually to do and specialize on the, the cellular level uh, process, which is called autophagocytosis, take place when cells cell are literally renovated, like you renovate a house. Man, you becoming a new of your, you're renewing yourself, you're renovating yourself. Yet, most people don't give themselves ever this chance. Well, you can practically, well, you can practically, Ari, you can put, enjoy this process, incredible, awesome process, for 18 hours a day, in theory, 10 hours a day. How about I negotiate six hours a day? <laughs> Most people don't have it a minute a day. <laughs> they don't give it a chance. Yeah. So, in a cumulative effect, even on the six hours a day, just imagine yourself the advantage that you get over other people. It is unheard of. It's a body that constantly renew itself. And if aging already happened, we have a system that can still defeat it. Yeah. You just need to keep it, wake it up. Home is the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and on, I think a lot of the research now is really hinting towards the fasting window daily fasting window needing to be at least 12 hours? Most likely, it depends again, how do you check fasting? I check it from the morning because I, I don't call fasting stopping the meal. It takes six hours, sometimes more for the food to be digested. For a person like me, yesterday I was in a high fat day, for instance, it sometimes even take longer, you understand? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have people and I know people, including my family, who can eat close to three quarters of a pound of nuts, it's a lot of calories and still lose weight compared to much less food and less calories on another diet. So bottom line is this, once your stomach is empty, that's where fasting starts. Mm -hmm. So I would say, let's say your stomach is empty, empty five, six o'clock in the morning. That's the real fasting start. So by 12 o'clock, you're already on the six hours of fasting. Um, by six o'clock in the evening, you understand? Um, you are basically 12 hours fasting, decent time to have supper. I agree with you, but that's a real fasting time. Um, but again, Ari, it doesn't have to be that way. You can have berries, you can have nutrients. There was recent research about eating grapes. You would accept the grape who raise blood sugar. But when you eat the old fashioned grape, the pumice with the skin and the pizza and everything, research shows that actually reduce blood sugar. Wow. 
So it's a very interesting phenomenon how to navigate between the food option that we have. But bottom line, my recommendation, beside intermittent fasting, move away all anti hormetic food and chemicals if you can. Mm -hmm. okay. which, which is sugar. Sugar central. Refined sugar. And, yes. Pesticides and, and synthetic vitamins. Guys, listen. I know most of you take vitamins. You think it's very healthy for you. The truth is synthetic vitamin and antioxidant are extremely counter-effective. Yeah. They inhibit your body's own ability to produce your own much more powerful antioxidant and it inhibits the absorption of real vitamins from food please do not take synthetic and, vitamins. and it also inhibits hormesis absolutely it, it inhibits the body i mean there's research from michael risto as I, I know you know of that where they've used antioxidant supplements before and after exercise and they showed that it inhibited the benefits on the mitochondria from from exercise yeah because it's take away the or your own mechanism if your mitochondria get the wrong signal, you're done. Mm -hmm. You can't even afford thinking about it. And what can be worse than putting synthetic antioxidant, inhibit your own glutathione peroxide production, your own antioxidant enzymes? What can be worse than that when your body cannot detect the level of free radical? Free radicals are a bad thing. And yeah. they do cause aging. But at the same time, like other paradox, they are the ones that trigger the stress response. They make you resilient. That's why exercise in, is so beneficial for you. Yeah, in, in the right dose and context, free yes. radicals are critical to the benefits of hormesis. It's part of the hormesis, but that's how your body basically detects that it's under stress. When you put synthetic antioxidant, your body becoming blind. Ari, I know I'm nothing against blind people, but quite honestly, it's, mu it's much more difficult, especially when you're under stress for a fight condition, to be blinded, um, your responses are compromised or sometimes totally shattered. That's for synthetic. So does it mean that antioxidants are bad for you? Absolutely not. If it's coming from whole food, reimplant, it's coming very small amount, in a system that proven over millions of years to work in this world very and, well. And, and actually a lot of the things that uh, people refer to in whole plant foods and herbs and spices they, that, that are referred to as antioxidants, there's a lot of research actually showing that many of these compounds uh, are actually, even though they may function as antioxidants in a test tube, they actually function as pro-oxidants, as free radicals inside right. the body and mimic hormesis. That's very true, and in fact, most plant polyphenol, if not all of them, are plant toxin. Mm -hmm. They actually help the plant resist pests, and uh, they were produced in many times as toxin. And many of them have, we develop a taste for that. We and other animals are attracted to that. But some animals cannot take the bitter taste of tannins or polyphenols, you know. So we live in a very interesting world that nature is full of paradox we just need to understand them and embrace them running they're running away from that mm -hmm. yes green yeah. tea is a toxin is for many animals mm -hmm. uh, your dogs cannot even eat it yet if you have a dog i don't know if you do if I you do. have it okay so clearly your dog would like to go and eat grass and so is my dogs and my cat they love grass because grass and dog also through the earth because they are full of this hormetic nutrient that otherwise wouldn't add it to their food you know so they're attracted to that we must understand it that we have to follow our bio biology and never go against it mm -hmm. if we do it right we can reach very far yeah. So we only have a, a few minutes left. There's a number of other things that I, I wanted to cover with you, but we won't have time. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the fact that you're advocating mostly a plant-based diet and you're not a big advocate of uh, animal flesh consumption. Um, if, if we're able to dig into that in just for a couple minutes, that would be great. Um, the other one that I wanted to 
we talked briefly at the at kind of about this desire for stress that humans are built to seek out stress, which I think is a great concept that you discuss in your book. And then the the, the last concept that I, I was hoping that you'd talk about is uh, there's a very, very interesting chapter in your book where you talk about the human desire to adopt plants and animals, to, to be around uh, other life forms and to cultivate them and to ex coexist with them and nurture them. And uh, what, can you talk a bit about why you felt compelled to add that section to this book on stress and why you feel it's so important? You're right, it's a lack of time. It's going to be very hard in two minutes to cover everything, but I'll try to do the best. We can always continue our conversation some other time because we only... I would love that. Well, yeah, so I deliberately put the book of um, our design to adapt animals and grow plants uh, because this is part of um, natural phenomena, which is, of uh, course, uh, coexistent between species and collaboration between cis. There is no argument that we evolve in the world that is built this way. One species need the other. Uh, we cannot survive without plants, and actually plants cannot survive without animals. Animals uh, disperse uh, the plant seeds, um, or distribute the pollens. Um, so bees and other animals are very important for plants and plant nutrients are critical for all animals, including humans. In fact, we depend on plant nutrients than any other food group. Uh, there is no question, and uh, I disagree with the paleo people on that. Maybe some of them will agree with me that our research on nutrients actually coming from plant, we can do very well without animal food. We cannot do well, we cannot survive without plant food. That simple. Um, all that said, some animal food or byproduct of animal food, like that, does not involve killing of the animal itself, such as dairy, for instance, milk and eggs um, are okay. And yes, and I wasn't completely against animal because I myself eat fish. And I eat it honestly because I guess I'm not feeling yet sorry enough. Sorry, but not sorry enough for the kind of fish that I eat. Um, but there's a huge difference between eggs, dairy, fish, and mammals. Um, I can give you the example from dairy. When you eat, for instance, saturated fat, which is not ideal, but in the case of dairy, it can be very beneficial. If the dairy comes from grass fed, nutrition stress animal. Uh, the dairy is objective. The fat is, it does not have inflammatory hormones inside. You cannot even find them. So, a butter of a healthy cow or cheese or whole milk can be very beneficial for you when you consider the quality of the protein and the immune uh, fraction inside. Um, take a fat from a killed or slaughtered or butchered animal, whether it's a cow or a pig or a, or a lamb, this fat contain inflammatory hormones. You're, you're talking about in conventionally raised yes. cows and, and pigs and lambs. Including the, those claimed to be grass-fed, which are in a better shape, but still they have inflammatory hormone because of the stress that the animals go through before they're being slaughtered, the fear. I mean, I don't even want to think in my mind what this poor intelligent animal goes through. So here's an animal that was supposed to give you right food without killing it, and people are killing it, and there's a karma. They pay dearly for that. Uh, I know that there is a controversy, but the signs clearly show that people thrive and live amazingly good on a lacto-vegetarian diet. And quite the opposite is the research about meat eaters. Um, the correlation between cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, especially inflammatory disease, and meat eating is direct. But that's not the reason I'm 
I wrote this chapter. The main reason is really humane. Guys, did you ever look at a cow and a calf? And all of you are good people, but guys, how can you possibly kill such a cute, intelligent animal? Do you have a dog or a cat at home? Can you imagine that somebody will eat your pet? This cow or a calf or a pig, an intelligent animal, they are cute. They are cute when they are young and they are cute when later, and we don't need to raise them to butcher them, okay? They should just have the right to live. We should take advantage of the byproduct without killing them. And the same with birds. The same with birds. There's no reason to eat that. Nutritionally, it doesn't add you nothing. Okay, there's an iron in the meat that surely we can substitute with other sources that coming from the earth hey, you know, cocoa beans, cocoa, mm -hmm. almost iron equivalent amount to that in beef. We can get it from molasses or other stuff in small amount. There's no raisins in small amount. There's no reason to kill an animal. If we do that, we are now disturbing the whole ecological balance um, upon which we evolve uh, to strive. Not, not only the spread of methane gas, which is so toxic, we are losing our agricultural resources, contaminating the earth. The amount of energy and the amount of pesticides and other chemicals that typical farming need to nourish the typical factory cattle or factory cow is staggering. So who benefit from that? The chemical business, the big agriculture uh, and the food industry that give you rendered meat, it's of slaughtered animal that you didn't hunt, you didn't even walk for that, you don't even know what you get, you don't even know, you know when an egg is rancid, you know when a cheese get bad, it stinks, egg float on the water, it also stinks horribly, we learn how to detect rancy food since the evolution of human animal. We, know, we cannot detect meat rancidity. And even if we can, I can tell you, as predator, we can kill. But we are not biologically evolved for meat eating. We don't have the enzyme of cana or feline that can convert D protein back to L protein. We just in the end of the line of doing that. So recent protein, that means protein that reverse the position from L level to day devil. Devil protein is like the devil. They float I mean, this amino acid in your system and they land themselves in your brain. In, the, in your mitochondria, in the center of your cell, and turn the organ on the organal to be dysfunctional. Bottom line is this, eat fresh food that you know is good. Plant food should be the primal. You should listen to your humane instinct. And if you really love animal, if you have a pet at home, or if at least you love animal, show this compassion to other animal, you have, I know it's very difficult to stop eating meat when you are raised to eat meat, but I do believe that you can train yourself and you're gonna be rewarded generously for that. No need for that. Even if you're an artist and you need to show much more protein inside, the other sources, dairy is dairy and even veg vegetable protein give you better. But last thing is this, Ari, we already know from research clearly that the vegetable protein benefit you as you age more and more, and they are much more anti-cancerous than animal protein. Something in nature of slow absorption or because the low amino score, relatively low amino score, that benefit us when we combine vegetable protein. So I do believe that our attraction we adapt animal because it's a very primal instinct. It's part of the cross collaboration between species. Human could never survive as a species alone. 
we'd always needed animal around us. They walk with us, we feed them, we collaborated. We had donkeys, I love these animals, one of my favorite animals is donkeys. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love donkeys. They are the underdogs of the animals <laughs> and I love them. So we live with donkeys and we live with horses and goats and sheep and cow and dogs and cats, including wild cats. And some people even have wolves. There's nothing wrong with it. It's part of a natural rule of collaboration between species. And the same with plants. We need plants. We enjoy the sight of them. We want to plant them. Um, in my country, every time a children is born, it was a tradition to plant a tree mm -hmm. in the hills of Jerusalem. It's just something nice uh, that you, it's a gesture, a traditional gesture to nature. Yeah. And, we, and, you know, as I was telling you before we started the interview, uh, both you and I actually have gardens and, and I, one of the reasons this chapter resonated with me so much is it is, there is this weird sort of innate joy of planting plants, uh, also for animals, but planting plants and, and watching them grow and nurturing them and seeing them grow into something beautiful that then, that then nurtures and nourishes you. And it's, it's this beautiful synergy that happens there that most people are, are unfortunately very disconnected from. Disconnected by the Kabbalah, which is a Jewish mysticism, uh, killing or destroying a, a fruit tree is a sin. It's a terrible sin. You're not supposed to do that. And um, they all, there's also the belief that trees are coming in front of humans to God in heaven. Mm. Regardless, um, I, I really, really ask people, if you, buy, if you get my book, read this chapter yeah. and, and see for yourself. It's just a different view, but it's also based on science and consequences. Yeah, and, and I, I really appreciate that you've integrated an ethical and humane and moral aspect of your message when, when most people who are talking about health are really totally disconnected from those aspects. They don't, they talk about things purely in terms of here's what's healthy for humans without really an understanding of the connectedness of humans and other life forms. So I, I, I really appreciate that you integrate that into your message. And thank you for sharing it here with, with my audience. And is there any final thing, final idea that you want to leave people with before we close? There is never a final idea. It's a process, <laughs> as you know, from ongoing research. Yes, I'm going to come soon with something new. We discussed it before. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, and I really enjoy talking to you, Ari. So Likewise. So we can continue. It's a discussion, basically. Yeah, I would love to have you on again. Oh, thank you, uh, and I'd love to do that. Um, um, you can just put like this. The book is available in Amazon. Read my book. Um, I'm always available on my social media, and we can continue the discussion. Um, I will soon come with some new blogs about fitness, uh, so just stand by. And between us, we can continue again what we discussed off the record. Very yeah. interesting. And thank you very much for inviting me. I enjoyed this uh, conversation. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for, for being on. It's, it's an honor to, to have connected with you after you know, reading your work for so many years, almost two decades. So a couple of things I'll, I'll say to conclude. Everyone, make sure you go pick up your copy of Ori's new book, Seven Principles of, of Stress. Uh, and um, also, start getting on integrating more levels of hormesis into your life. So Ori, thank you so much. Such an honor and a privilege to connect with you. Thank you again. I enjoyed this conversation. We'll be in touch, Ori. Definitely. Thanks.